All right, well, we are in Proverbs chapter 22 still. Chapter 22, and I'm going to be taking 17 to 21. And the title for tonight is Hearing and Applying the Written Word of Truth. Hearing and Applying the Written Word of Truth. In a day and an age like ours, with the very existence of truth is doubted or relegated to nothing more than relative truth. And you know what that's like. Well, this is true for me, but maybe not true for you. And what's true for you is not true for me. Uh, that's, that's, they've cheapened truth by that way. right? And we face the challenge as the church of shining the light of God's truth that's revealed in his word in this dark world. So shining this light, it's more than just reading the Bible, but knowing God and his word, having studied it with the intent of living it out. It's in the living out of God's word that we shine the brightest, and we can do so confidently and with all assurance and be completely narrow-minded about what we declare as truth because God is the only one who has a monopoly on truth, and he is eager to share it with those who are searching for and those who love the truth. We can say amen to probably our new brother Eli, that he was searching for truth, and he went to this gathering, and he found it. <laughs> amen. So beginning in Proverbs 22, verse 17 to 21. Let's just read through these four verses, and then we'll take it verse by verse. Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise, and apply your heart to my knowledge. For it is a pleasant thing if you keep them within you. Let them all be fixed upon your lips, so that your trust may be in the Lord." I have instructed you today, even you. Have I not written to you excellent things of counsels and knowledge, that I may make you know the certainty of the words of truth, that you may answer words of truth to those who send to you? All right, so beginning in verse 17. Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply your heart to my knowledge, to hear in this verse and in many such passages involves hearing intently, hearing intelligently, paying close attention to not merely hear, but to hearken. Now the difference between them is hearing is a very passive thing. You could be at the dentist's office and in the background, you hear some background music, you hear it, but you're not really intently listening there, all right? But hearkening, that is a very active thing where you are hearing with the intent of obeying. To hear in this case is to have discernment and understanding. So we want to hear the words of the wise, those who are knowledgeable in the word of the Lord, who are able to give good and godly counsel and instruction, and to receive their counsel and knowledge. And above this, we want to hear the word from our wonderful Lord, our supreme counselor, the word incarnate, through the word inspired. You know, when it comes to counsel, I always ask the one seeking godly counsel these three questions. Are you in the word? Is your prayer life healthy? And are you in regular godly fellowship? If they answer yes to all three questions, okay, then we can go ahead and get into the counseling. If their response to is, is no to any one or more of those, I encourage them to fill in the gap. Get involved in all three aspects. Get into the Word of God regularly. Have that healthy prayer life. Get into godly fellowship with the saints, with godly saints. And I tell them, do that for, I don't know, maybe a week or two, whatever, and just see if God will not move himself and present himself as their counselor. 
and provide answers uh, that they need in life. And there are those, of course, who, after having done so, uh, are still needing godly counsel. And Pastor Sonny and is very gracious of providing that and with, uh, with our sister Marla. So even if you've done all that stuff and you're, you're not getting any answers or whatever, well, then there you are. You, you've got an open door right there. And that's, that's godly counsel. So this, uh, this counsel that we receive from the Lord, directly from the Lord in his word, right? This is our good shepherd that leads and guides us through his counsel, by his leading, through the scriptures, the spirit moving through the word of God to direct you and direct your life. So it says to apply your heart to knowledge. To apply here in the, in the Hebrew, it means to set, to establish, to lay down, to lay down a foundation. Interesting. Just as one digs deep in order to lay a foundation for any building, we want to bury the knowledge of God's word deeply into our hearts. The application of the doctrine of God is the objective of all meditation in the word, in all of our study of the holy revelation of God. It's that application that we want. One might learn some very deep things of Scripture if for all that learning and studying it's not applied, such a person is considered foolish. That's what it says in Matthew 7, 26. Suppose there was a pharmacist who came up with an unknown and mysterious lethal disease but being a pharmacist, he could experiment with different drugs and chemicals and whatnot and maybe come up with a, a cure. And he, through all the study and the working of these various drugs and whatnot, actually did come up with a cure and you're visiting him. And you're holding his hand and trying to comfort him and saying, you know, we're hoping the best. He says, well, you know, uh, after a lot of uh, research and application and whatnot in, in the, these drugs and whatnot, I found a cure. You did. Did you take it? No, it's sitting there on the shelf. What are you waiting for? You, you got it. Apply it. And, that, and if he's not doing that, that's, that's, isn't that foolish? Well, that's what it's like if we do all that learning of God's word and don't apply it to our life. It's foolish like that. All right? And also let's remember, too, when the Lord gives us his truth in this book, we are given much and therefore we are required much. God's made each and every one of us stewards, caretakers of God's truth. And he's going to call into account how faithful a steward we are in not just keeping this word in our hearts, but having it grow out of our life. Just as was indicated earlier, we're trees of life in that sense. We sow God's word into our hearts. The seed brings forth fruit. And, and that's what the world really needs, is that love, that joy, that peace, most of all, that salvation, all right? So, and, and, you know, being a steward of God's word and being accountable for what you have received, this is one reason why the scripture uh, kind of gives a warning about not having many teachers, right? James chapter 3, verse 1 to 2. My brothers, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Gulp. <laughs> For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, see, the tongue, he is a perfect or a mature man able to bridle the whole body. So one sure mark of spiritual maturity is the ability to control this untamable member here in our mouth, right? If we have the discipline to govern our own tongue, then we will be effective in governing the church. And another mark of spiritual maturity is that we are peacemakers, right? We don't want to quarrel. We don't want to be um, creating strife or contention. We want to look to see where it may be in evidence and bring about peace in that. That's James chapter 3, verse 18. It talks about being peacemakers. Okay, so in the next verse, it states that the word of God should be upon our lips. 
But before it can be spoken by our lips, and that's assuming that you're not just opening the Bible and reading it in your hand, that's assuming that it's in your heart, right? It must be heard by the ear and then planted in the heart, in the mind, before it can be on your lips. In Proverbs 22, verse 18, it says here, For it is a pleasant thing if you keep them, that is the words of wisdom, within you, let them all be fixed upon your lips. So we want to keep the word within us. We want to guard and to protect it. That's what that word keep means, to guard, to supervise, to watch over, to protect. Because our enemy is a thief. He is a seed stealer. And he wants to steal the seed out of your life, out of your mind. And he wants to, uh, and he will. He will do this in Matthew 13, okay, and John chapter 10. Both of those uh, bring up how Satan uh, will go and steal the seed. And Satan is a, a thief, a, a, a murderer, and a liar. You know, he, he is going to do whatever he can to steal by distracting us either with lesser things so that we're not giving priority to the Word of God or by undermining our faith in the Word, causing us to doubt this holy revelation. That's his objective. That's what he wants to do with you. And the Hebrew word here used for fixed, it's similar in meaning to apply in verse 17. It means to establish, to set up, to be prepared. And where apply carries the idea of burying deep, right? like that foundation I was talking about. Okay, the word fixed here conveys the picture of setting something up, of uh, uh, an edification of some kind, right? Something that is based on a foundation. And we know that those in uh, Matthew chapter 7 who hear the word and obey it, they have a house, that, that building, on that sure foundation that is the rock. And that house can shine the light. And will shine the light. But in Matthew 12, <clears throat> verse 34b to 35, it says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You see the connection there? Heart, mouth. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. He speaks forth truth. He speaks forth righteousness, holiness. He speaks forth the gospel. An evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things, everything you see that's in this world. And it says in our verse here in Proverbs, it is a pleasant thing. It's a pleasant thing. We delight in the knowledge that we acquire from the word, either directly uh, through our own study or the study of faithful pastors and Bible teachers. If you want to turn to Psalm 119, Psalm 119, verses 14 to 18. Mm -hmm. Say amen when you get there. Amen. That's a lot of amens. Okay. Verse 14. It says, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches i will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways i will delight myself in your statutes i will not forget your word deal bountifully with your servant that i may live and keep your word see that word keep same idea guard cherish protect oversee open my eyes that i may see wondrous things from your law. You get the same idea in Psalm 1, verse 2. And of course, we also delight in the author of the scriptures, the Lord himself. Uh, in Psalm 37, verse 4, it says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Do you know that when you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give godly desires and plant them in your heart as you delight in him? Right? As you delight in him, you won't have these ungodly desires. You're going to have godly, wonderful, awesome, pleasing, righteous desires. And delight, you know what that word means? Delight here 
is, is, is in the obeying him, in the worshiping him, but in a certain way. To have a soft heart, pliable, moldable, delicate. To be so sensitive to the Lord that he has only to, as it were, guide you with his eye and not use a bit and brittle to have to yank you this way and yank you that way. Right? He doesn't want to do that. Right? Those bits hurt. Right? Those, those, things, you know, those horses with those things in their mouths, it's like on their tender lips. That's not pleasant. Right? So the Lord doesn't want that. He wants us to delight in Him and be soft-hearted toward Him so that it's just He, he can lead us gently. Right? Okay, so, and then also in Psalm 19, verses 13 to 14, it says, Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. So you see that connection there between the heart and the words that we speak. All right? So continuing on in Proverbs 22, 19, so that your trust may be in the Lord. I have instructed you today, even you. And just as King Solomon was teaching his son all of this stuff, the Lord is saying to us, your trust is to be in the Lord. The Lord has instructed you today, even you. Amen. So when you look in the Old Testament, you find how many times does the word faith appear in the Old Testament? What would be your guess? If you were to throw out a number, what would you say? 1,200. Do I hear 1,400? <laughs> right? You know how many there are references to the word faith in the Old Testament? Two. Two? <laughs> Deuteronomy 32 20 is one and Habakkuk 2 4 is the other why the Old Testament is twice as big as the New Testament only two references to faith well that's because in the Old Testament faith is equated with the word trust and you look up the word trust oh goodness you're going to find all kinds of references there all right but if you trust someone it should be because you believe they are a person of integrity. They, are, they have a trustworthiness, right? And that being the case, when they say something to you, you believe them. You can take them at their word. And God places his word above even his most holy name. Psalm 138, verse 2. So how trustworthy a person is who possesses all knowledge, all wisdom, all power, a person for whom it is impossible for them to lie, that's our God. Our God of grace and holiness can be trusted 101%. And you check out any book on promises from the scriptures. You know, we, we've all seen those little books and they all promises of the Bible. They have them written there. Think about a book like that. Maybe you have one at home. Leave through that tonight. Leave through that because there you're seeing what our trustworthy God promises to his children and in some cases even in a, in a general sense to everyone. Proverbs 3, 5, verse 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord. With all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. See, that's that's where I get into trouble. <laughs> I I, I want to express my trust, Lord. I trust you. Whatever you you're gonna do, you know, I trust you're gonna work the situation out. Uh, but you know, Lord, you know how you could do this if you if you did this, and over here, you know, <laughs> I start leaning on my, you know, I become God's counselor. I'm leaning on my own understanding, and I'm sure our, our, our Abba Father's up there just smiling and shaking his head. Oh, James, you've got no clue, <laughs> right? So we don't want to lean on our own understanding. His ways are so far above ours. And when he starts working out answers and solutions to your life, he doesn't go necessarily from A to B to C. 
You might go from A to M to B to Z and a path that you would never anticipate. And so, but that's, that's where we trust him, right? And so in all of your ways, all of your ways, see, we trust with all our heart and all of our ways we acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Even if you're not aware of, of how he's leading you, he, he, he's leading his children. He is a faithful shepherd. All right. So Solomon here admonishes his son so that their trust may be in the Lord, not in man. Even godly saints of the very best of intentions right, can't be as trustworthy as our holy God just because they're human. And there are some things that are beyond our control. You know. So while you may, because I mean, I've said this uh, to Sonny, I, I believe I said this to Albert, you know, I trust them with my life, you know. And I'm, I'm not being flippant. I would trust my life to them because that's, that's the kind of integrity these men have. And I, I would do that. But I know that they are not as trustworthy as God because God's almighty, right? He never has a failing. He ne you never are going to hear God say, whoops. <laughs> never going to happen, right? So we, we can have absolute implicit trust in the Lord. And think about this, too. All of us who have committed our lives, ourselves, to the Lord, we have entrusted him with our very souls. And, and since we've trusted him to deliver us from condemnation and eternal damnation, having given us eternal life and reserved our place in the kingdom of God that shall rule for all eternity, we can trust him for that, right? Then we can trust him with all of these smaller things of life, like delivering us from bankruptcy or providing us for our needs when we've just lost our job or healing us from cancer or protecting us in the days of evil. Those are not small things, but compared to what God has done for us on the cross, they are. They are small things. And the greater work is the forgiveness of our sins, not physical healing. That's out of Matthew 9, 2. The greater work is having our names written in the book of life, not casting out demons, Luke 10, 20. So as I said, Satan's job is to convince you that God is without integrity, that he misleads you, that he is holding out on you, that he's not going to give you the best that you could have. He wants you to doubt God's word and God's heart. And even the Lord Jesus found that he couldn't do many great miracles in his own home country uh, because they expressed doubt and unbelief. That's Matthew 13. And you can limit God because of your unbelief and doubts. That can happen. And if we have any doubts or unbelief in any area of our lives, what should be our response? The same response as a father had when his son was demon-possessed, but who had a measure of unbelief in his heart he said to Jesus, if you can do anything, help us. And Jesus turned it around. If you can believe, all things are possible to those who believe. And the father cried out with tears for his boy that he loves so much. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And Jesus went to work. And he began to cast this demon out. A funny thing happened, though. If you notice when you read that, the boy, uh, the demon threw him down, and the boy fell as one dead. Now, he was, at one point, he was, he was moving, he was active, and he was possessed, but at least he was alive, and now he's fallen like he's, he's laying there dead. Even after he entrusted Jesus to help, it looked like the situation got worse. That may happen to you, saints, as you're praying. The situation may get worse, but don't Trust your circumstances. Your trust is in the Lord. And Jesus raised that boy up and delivered him safely to his father. So in ancient Israel, 
there came a time when few even bothered to know the Lord. And this led to widespread worship of uh, false gods, apostasy. And how did all that start? It was after the death of Joshua. In Judges chapter 2, in verses 10 to 11, listen to this. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, that's the generation just immediately after Joshua died, another generation rose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. They didn't know. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals, the false gods. So they failed to instruct their children as the Lord had commanded them. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses 6 to 7. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 beginning verse 6, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently, persistently, faithfully to your children. And shall talk to them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lay down, and when you rise up. That was their duty, and they failed. And it led to apostasy. And today, here in America, we see the same situation. Uh, too many parents are leaving the spiritual development of their children to Sunday school teachers and youth pastors. The quality of some of these is, is not very much uh, to be desired. They're rather poor in many of these. As one who's been involved in uh, children's ministry uh, for several years now, not just here, but uh, in other fellowships, <clears throat> I've noticed uh, the children that have been taught by their parents, you can tell, and those that have not. And... The percentage fluctuates, but on an average, it's, I'd say it's probably about 5%. 5% of the children are well taught. The others, not so much. We have to remember, Sunday school teachers are not replacements for parents in biblical instruction. We are not replacements. We are partners with parents. We are to work together for the raising up of these children. They are our future. So Proverbs 22, verse 20. The question, have I not written to you excellent things of counsels and knowledge? Again, Solomon said this to his son, but the Lord is saying this same thing to his adopted sons and daughters here tonight. The Lord told us that he has made everything known to us who are not just his servants anymore, but are his friends. Everything that the Father gave to him, he has revealed to us. He said so in John chapter 15. Now, Abraham is a friend of God, and the Lord didn't keep back from him what he was about to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. He will not keep that secret from his friend Abraham. And then Daniel, the greatly beloved. Look at the revelation that God gave that man. And John the Apostle, the entire book of Revelation, uh, including the Gospel of John and the Epistles. He who was great, greatly beloved, the Lord shared with him uh, the truth. And then you look at us and what the Lord has given to us. Wow. That is amazing. The entire Revelation, the complete canon from Genesis to Revelation. And as I said before, to whom much is given is much required. And we are required as disciples of Christ and God's stewards to read what he's provided for us, to study and to meditate upon the word and to apply it to our lives, not by our own power or abilities, thank you, Lord, <laughs> but by the power of the Spirit who enables us when we say yes to God and surrender our members, our minds, our bodies, our hearts to the Lord, to righteousness. Um, can you please turn to Romans chapter 6? I was only going to refer to this, but I think this is important to read. Romans chapter 6, 
verses 13 to 19. Paul here says to the church at Rome, Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield or surrender yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. That's all of us who are born again. We were spiritually dead, and by the Spirit of God, we are now alive from the dead. And our members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. You know, do you not know that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience to righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but have obeyed from where? The heart, that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So that's what we want. We want the Word of God to dwell richly in us to produce that fruit of the Spirit. We want the Word of God to rule, uh, and, and the Spirit of God to rule over us, to dominate us in the loving, gentle way that only He can. And we do these things by our apl application of the Word and prayer and godly fellowship. This is important, our fellowship here at the church. Very important. Uh, I, I can't see any Christian having a healthy spiritual life that tries to go it alone. I've never seen it happen. I've been a Christian for 44 years. I've not once seen an example, with the exception of those that are in solitary confinement, okay? I think there's grace there for such people, all right? Um, but why do we have the written word of God? We're reading in this section of Proverbs that these things are written, right? These are words that have been written. Why do we have the written word of God? The Lord Jesus pointed out that the scriptures point to him. So the scriptures testify of him. John chapter 5, verse 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify, Jesus said, of me. And the scriptures provide for us so that we may believe the Lord Jesus Christ and have eternal life. John 20 Verse 31 says, but these, speaking of words of Scripture, are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And then 1 John 5, 13, again, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of God of the Son of God. Paul the Apostle, testifying before the Roman governor Felix and the Jewish leadership. There in Acts chapter 24, verse 14, he says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. And Psalm 40, verse 7 to 10, there it talks about how the entire volume of the book is written of Jesus. And it's an awesome thing when you study Scripture. You look for the face of Jesus in any page of Scripture, you will find him. It's all about him. Scripture provides us with biblical history so that we may learn and be admonished by the successes and failures of others in Romans 15 4 for whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope and in 1 Corinthians 10 11 it says now all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends 
of the ages have come. So we have examples in Scripture. We can see where someone really messed up and we're like, ooh, okay, I'm not going to do that. You know, or we see someone who's had great success. Wow, that's a good example. I'm going to do that. Right? So we are exhorted that way. And God the Son, addressing God the Father, said this in Hebrews 10, 7. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. Why? To do your will, O God. And the spirit of prophecy inspired holy men to record the written word of God. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, it says, For prophecy never came, prophecy, that's God's word, never came by the will of man. We didn't think this up of our own, our, our own noggin here. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Um, I will often get challenged by people about the Bible. Oh, well, the Bible was written by men. And I say, well, you're half right. And they, what do you mean? And I tell them, well, get a piece of paper out and a pen. And they do. All right, now write your name on there. And they do. All right, now who wrote that? Well, I did. Are you sure? Yes. Well, now, did you write that really or did the pen? Well, I wrote it using the pen to write my name. Right. Now, God used 40 pens, as it were, 40 writers. And just as you guided your hand using your brain to write out those letters that spell out your name, God used these holy men of God, inspired them to write his word. So yeah, the words, the physical words, were written by men, but it was inspired by the very mind of God to direct those men. All right, so Proverbs 22, and finally the last verse, 21 That I may make you know the certainty, mark that, the certainty of the words of truth, that you may answer words of truth to those who send to you. Now, how certain are you that this book that you hold in your hands is the very word of God? How certain are you about that? Can you prove to others that this Bible is the inspired word of God. By studying the scriptures, and especially, uh, but not exclusively, prophecy, we can know with certainty that this book contains the word of truth. Our faith is not a blind faith, but a reasonable faith based on evidence that enables us to trust God at his word. The last verse for tonight, 1 Peter 3.15. 1 Peter 3.15. This is good for us as we are going out on our Saturday outreach. Something to keep in mind. It says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you, a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And that's, that's what it's all about, saints, to be able to present the gospel, the word of truth to the lost with meekness and fear and have that ready defense to show that this is indeed God's word. Before we close in prayer, I have some websites I want to share with you guys. These are websites of apologetics. Okay? So I'm going to rattle these off for you. Uh, the first is, uh, they're all www. Right? So you know that. Uh, Cross-examined, with a D at the end. Cross-examined.org. That's Frank Turek. We have a curriculum for the Sunday school that's based on a curriculum that Frank Turek came up with. Awesome, very awesome. How many here have read the book, uh, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist? You're kidding. Really? Oh, you guys got to repent. <laughs> That's an awesome book, a very awesome book. I would highly recommend that. I know Jeff's read it. Uh, I've read it. We both read it, oh, maybe two or three times. Really good book. Well, he's the one that does crossexamined.org. Another one is answersingenesis.org. And that's really good for uh, to disprove evolution, 
to show that there is a creator God. And they do other things, but they really specialize in that. And then there's CARM, C-A-R-M. That's Christian uh, Apologetics and Research Ministry, CARM.org. That's another good one. Another one is, it's not really an apologetic site. It's more of a Q&A thing, but they do have a lot of questions there that deal with apologetics, and that's gotquestions.org. I use them routinely uh, in my teaching, in my articles. Really good site. Three more websites. Apologetics.com. That's A-P-O-L-O-G-E-T-I-C-S apologetics.com and then those of us who know our brother uh, Kevin Parrott there is oncelost.com and there's a hyphen between once and lost so it's once hyphen lost.com and then of course there's my humble little thing here that I've whipped together uh, over the years uh, the truth under fire we, now you got it on your phone and you're going to see the mobile version so if you scroll all the way to the bottom and look at the web version, and then you just take your phone and kind of turn it sideways, and then you'll see all kinds of tabs along the top. And then near the left, you see apologetics. And there are something like 40 different uh, categories. Not 40 articles, but 40 different categories of apologetics there. And that, I think my colleague, Ann Kisley, she did... Uh, the legwork for like 90% of that. And so she did a lot of really good work. All right, and so those are the those there. And if you didn't get those websites, uh, if you go to my website, thetruthunderfire.com, tomorrow morning I'll have what I'm teaching tonight. I'll have that on there, so all those links will be there. And I have links to these books too, so you can click on the links for the books, and uh, you can get... Now this first one is Alleged Discrepancies of the Bible. You hear all the time, oh, the Bible's full of contradictions. Well, there are what might appear to be contradictions, but when you read through Scripture, compare Scripture with Scripture, you find out there's no discrepancies here at all. Now, this one I got here is an old version. Uh, they, they've got newer uh, publications that's a lot more uh, user-friendly. The, the, the printing on this is a little odd, So, uh, but they do have more modern versions that are much easier. This one, I want to maybe do this for our discipleship class sometime, uh, because this is Ron Rhodes' five-minute apologetics for today. And it's 365 pages, and he deals with one topic on each page. So you can almost do this almost like a devotional type thing and read about one apologetic uh, Bible treatment to show that the Bible is indeed God's Word, you can do that once a day. So that's really kind of cool. This is a more recent one. And then if you really want to get serious, if you really want to go deep, all right, I use this thing quite a bit, is, oh, this thing is heavy. <laughs> Baker's Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics by Norman Giesler. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Geisler? Giesler? Norman. <laughs> and this is a really, I mean, this is this encyclopedia. So this has got some really in-depth, thorough information on apologetics. So I just want to encourage you guys, because your, your, your biblical Christian, for the most part, they know what they believe in the scriptures. They, you can ask, what do you believe? And they can write a lot of verses and, and talk doctrine. But then when you get to ask them, well, why do you believe it? Not all of them, but many of them are a little, they're a little shaky there. So that's where apologetics comes in. So we, need, we all need to be absolutely confident in God's word. All right. So define for apologetics. Apologetics, yeah. Well, apologetics is basically showing uh, that the scriptures uh, have evidence to support that this is indeed God's word. Some of those evidences are internal. Right? There's things that are in the text itself of the Bible that shows that this is God's Word. One of the things I mentioned is prophecy. There's prophecies that are hundreds, some thousands of years old, that have come true. Jesus fulfilled 300 prophecies in His first coming. Right? So there are internal evidences that show that this is God's Word. Then there are the external evidences, archaeological things, 
geographical things, the uncovering of cultures. Uh, I think it was the Amorites back in the 1950s. It was as recent as that where cynics and atheists mocked Christians and made fun of the Bible. All oh, these stupid Christians, they believe in these Amorites, these fictitious people. There's no evidence that the Amorites ever even existed. And then a few years later, <laughs> they found, archaeologists found evidence of the people, the culture of the Amorites. And all those cynics and atheists had nothing to say. All right. So that's basically apologetics. So uh, with that, uh, let's have a close word of prayer.